Hello, I'm John Chivaco, the co-chair of the NIGEO 2023 conference and a board member of the New York Geothermal Energy Organization. I'd like to welcome you to this recording of a live presentation from the conference, a two-day event which was held in Albany, New York on April 26th and 27th of 2023. This year's educational sessions and keynotes represent the latest in ground source heat pump system design, product innovations, and installation practices, along with important policy, regulatory, financing, and incentive updates. This presentation is one of over 40 sessions from the two-day event, all of which were recorded and available at NIGEO's website, www.ny-geo.org along with session descriptions and a link to download the slides from each of the sessions presented. NIGEO is proud to make this content available to our members and other industry stakeholders. And if you are a member, thanks so much for your support and participation. If you find this content valuable and for some odd reason, you are not yet a member, consider joining NIGEO at the appropriate membership level with details available at our website. The live recording from the NIGEO 2023 conference will start in just a moment. Thanks so much for listening. Good afternoon. This breakout session is going to be discussing a site selection for geothermal networks. A geothermal network is a, the combining of a number of buildings with either a centralized or distributed renewable thermal energy source. And these thermal energy network systems. Lately, uh, there's between the NYSERDA pond on the U10 efforts and things like that, there's quite a few of them um, being built. The conversation today will focus on what makes a good geothermal network and where should we start and why. I'll be the moderator for this hour. My name's Joe Hitt. I work for the Department of Public Service in the Office of Markets and Innovation. We oversee the energy efficiency programs, the NYSERDA Clean Energy Fund, and lately the Utility Thermal Energy Networks and Job Acts. Um, I also serve as a technical lead for the, the U10 efforts. Uh, I'd like to introduce our panel, or let our inter panelists introduce themselves here. We'll start off with Daniel. Hey, how you doing? Uh, my name is Dan Flaherty. I'm a mechanical engineer with CDM Smith. Um, and I'll just kind of jump into it. I'm gonna, I'm here to give you kind of an overview, a uh, high level overview of some of the things that we start to look at when we're trying to develop sites uh, for site selection for network geothermal systems. Let's do quick in intros and then we'll come back for your presentation. Hi everyone, my name is Aaron Schauger. I'm an energy engineer and project manager with LaBella Associates. Um, we're a full service architecture engineering firm um, and our booth is just down outside the bathrooms if you wanna learn more. Hi, so uh, Mitch DeWine, I'm an energy and renewables team leader at CHA. Um, similar, we have a booth uh, kind of around the corner there. Uh, full service consulting engineering firm and, and very actively involved in both the U10 and C10 uh, kind of projects in New York State. Hi, I'm Zainab Magavi and co-executive director of HEAT. We're a nonprofit climate solutions incubator and we've been working on uh, geothermal networks for about five years now. All right, thanks everybody. We're gonna have a presentation from each of our panelists and then we'll have some time at the end for questions from all of you. So Dan, you wanna kick it off? Sure thing, thanks Joe. All right, um, so starting off, uh, you know, where, where do we start? Um, where do we start? Uh, so, you know, first things we gotta look at uh, when there's developing the system is you gotta look for loads um, in the buildings, some things, customer willingness types of loads. And then you gotta look for the distribution is gonna be part of the other issue, is the other issue you're gonna deal with. And then it's the source, the bore fields. Where are you extracting the heat to and from? How are you getting it in and out of the ground? So the first part is uh, the customer willingness. Um, this is uh, as part of the loads. Uh, you know, if you're a utility and you're trying to convert existing customers, it's who's going to want to do it. Um, what are some of the things you do for this? Um, you can do desktop assessments to look at um, social media to see who's interested. Is there anyone interested in the area to do these um, to do these systems? Is sustainability an important item? 
Um, you can look through social media to see what people in the local area are thinking and you know what is, what is the discussion going on in the area pertaining to sustainability and these types of systems. Um, other key assets are you know letters of support, uh, local government, um, uh, public works, and uh, community uh, organizations like YMCA, um, organization, organizations like that. Um, I'd say local government and public works, very important because you're going to be using their streets and most likely you're going to be using their assets for these things. Um, so to get, that, to get their support online initially is critical. And the last, the last part is kind of when you really have a site kind of nailed down is to, cam is to go cam is the canvas, knocking on door to door, going out and ensuring that yes, we have custom, we have support and that we can get letters of interest from, uh, from the community and that people are actually willing to convert over because it's not an easy process for them to convert from their natural gas to their, uh, you know, to go to a geo. Um, the next uh, part of the loads is, you know, the types of loads. Are you heating dominant load? Are you cooling dominant load? What types of buildings do you have? Um, you know, because the loads are important because, you know, because you don't want to run imbalanced and you're trying to really get, take advantage of simultaneous heating and cooling. Um, so if you have a mix of loads, that's great. If you don't, uh, you got to understand if you're going to be heating dominant and uh, cooling dominant. Another part of loads is not often thought of is load granularity. You can't have one building on your network geothermal system that's going to take up the entire load of your network geothermal system. So you have to have uh, you have to have multiple buildings and multiple loads on that building for it to work. Uh, another uh, uh, is conversion opportunities. You know what buildings are easy to convert when you're trying to convert existing buildings. Uh, do you have buildings that have a condenser water system where you, all you have to do that's on a boiler? and a cooling tower to cool it, and you know, it's an easy conversion just to switch out the heat pumps in the building, or are you gonna have to run a completely new system through those buildings? Um, so these are just kind of some of the types of buildings that are challenges, good, and, and poor candidates to be converted. Uh, the next one is, uh, you know, what are your client's goals? Um, this is kind of a big one, and you know, depending on your clients, it's more important, less, some of these things are more important, less important. You know, we were doing work for gas utilities, so a lot of these are, you know, how does their gas infrastructure in that area, you know, can converting to Network Geo solve some of their problems? Um, uh, those are good candidates. Another issue, another part of it is environmental justice and low-income communities. You know, who's funding, these pro who's funding these programs to move forward with these systems? You know, what are their goals and really kind of reaching out to those? Uh, the next part is, uh, you know, the distribution. You know, the hydronics. These are systems, these are closed loop, these are closed loop hydronic systems. They are subject to all the same problems and physics of a closed loop, geo, closed loop hydronic system inside of a building. You know, they get airbound, they get other problems. You know, we, we're running plastic pipe everywhere. Plastic pipe does not have an infinite uh, pressure rating. Um, so you gotta be able to watch out for, are you putting too much pressure in the system, not enough pressure in the system? And these are kind of some of the issues that you need to really look at when you're uh, designing these systems. Another part is the pumps and equipment. You know, these systems need pumps to operate. And guess what? The pumps have to go somewhere. So it's, not, and it's not necessarily cheap for the pumps just to be put out in the middle of, you know, put out in a little uh, pump house somewhere. You say, okay, that's pretty simple, pretty easy, straightforward, but that takes some thinking, it takes some cost, and putting them out is, you know, relatively difficult. You have to put the equipment in the building, but maybe you can find an existing building to put it into, but then you get into the services. Do you have enough electrical service in that building for the pumps? You know, do you have water connections, floor drains, heating, cooling? You know, you have to kind of think all these things through when you're finding places for this equipment to go. Another part of uh, distribution is you got to run the pipe somewhere. And, you, you know, you got to run a lot of it. Um, and th so the closer your loads are together, the less pipe you have to run. But these are some of the obstacles that you have to avoid. You know, rail lines, public transit tunnels, drinking water tunnels. Um, streams, rivers, uh, these are just things that are going to be hard to, hard to get around uh, or, hard, or these are things that you want to avoid. And then, you know, on the right is kind of things to work around. You know, if you're doing these systems in the public street, these are some of the utilities that are in the public street that you're going to be dealing with. And then, you know, another aspect to think about is how much traffic is in these streets. Um, you know, how much is walk, you know, how much are pedestrians using these streets? Are these critical corridors that people need to get through? And how much of the streets are you digging up? Um, and then you, we kind of get into the sources, um, uh, looking at the geology, and this is basically your bore field. 
where you're looking at, you know, depth to bedrock, uh, conditions, drillability, you know, how easy is it going to be to install it? What's the performance you're going to get out of the ground? Um, these are all things to, to look at and to kind of understand. And the last one is, and then uh, environmental contamination. Are you putting this, are you putting this support field in a Superfund site? That's going to be an expensive venture trying to, trying to move all that dirt out. So these are kind of things that we've kind of like run into uh, when we've been doing site selections. And, oh, and the last one is uh, permitting. Uh, so the, we need to confer, you know, you need to make sure that you can get all the permitting. Like I know in New York, you have the 500 foot uh, limit, you know, before the mining permit. Not, it's not that it can't be overcome, but it's, you know, a nuisance to overcome it. You get into other things like wetland resources and getting around those permits. And now I'll hand it over to Aaron. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I'll be touching on our approach to selecting thermal energy networks. Um, once again, my name is Aaron Schauger. I'm an energy engineer and project manager with Labella Associates. Um, I'll save a bunch of time and just uh, defer everyone to our booth. We're the one with all the Buffalo Bills gear. Um, we are the official architecture and engineering firm of the Bills. So you know, feel free to stop by if you want to talk about our our firm a little more or just uh, talk about Josh Allen. Happy to do that as well. Um, so real quick, I'll just touch on some of the two technical concepts that Dan alluded to a little earlier. Uh, the first is um, you know, your load profiles throughout the day for each building. Um, I show there on the right, um, you've got different building types and these are just typical uh, load profiles throughout the day. Um, this is for a day in July and it just shows that you know, you've got different types of buildings that peak at different times throughout the day, and that's a, a key concept to take into consideration as we're selecting buildings for these types of systems. Um, ideally, you want to have buildings that um, you know, peak at different times dur during the day, so that way um, you know, your total system load is less than the sum of all the individual building peak loads. Secondly, um, another key concept is your, your heating and cooling balance in the loop. Um, it's important to make sure that it's balanced for in, toward, in order to maintain long-term system performance. Um, so we show a, a graph there on the right showing um, you know, a, a combined network hourly loads for a year, and this one is, uh, you know, we usually encounter heating dominant loops in New York State. Um, so that's just a consideration as we're um, identifying buildings throughout our um, service territories and you know, state as a whole. So digging into it, um, we've got a site identification process and then a, a site evaluation process. Um, and I'll, I'll breeze right through the site identification process since it's pretty simple. Um, this is an example of a, a process that we did. So first we developed the project boundary. Um, that's real obvious. Some of these projects it's important to, to take into consideration if it's a disadvantaged community. And then obviously um, population density in the areas you know, you want to make sure these are, you want to make sure that you're in a, a dense er densely populated area because obviously the more buildings, the more occupants, um, you know, the more economical these systems um, can be. And then lastly, we overlaid um, some anchor buildings and, um, you know, in this climate, we're terming an anchor building as a building with a large cooling load that can help uh, balance out our system because, like I said, it's, New York is a, a cooling dominant climate, or sorry, heating dominant climate. So taking all that into consideration, we can essentially develop kind of a, a short list of uh, sites that you know, meet our criteria for load diversity, heating and cooling balance. Um, and then also take into consideration is there opportunity for other renewable energy like um, solar PV and also make sure that you know, there's adequate thermal resources, whether that's area for um, vertical bore fields um, surface water heat exchangers, sanitary sewer mains, or even you know underground aquifers. Um, so with that in mind, we, we typically develop it to a short list of you know 10 to 15 sites, depending on the client. Um, and as engineers, it's time to you know push up our glasses and start putting numbers on things a little bit. Um, so we have a, a set of uh, feasibility parameters that we've uh, developed, and this changes a little bit based on each project, um, and with each parameter, we have a, a weighting factor that we use to, to score our, our sites. Um, so the first we, we call customer acquisition risk. That's really um, the risk that we assign on a scale of 1 to 10 of a, 
a site or your anchor building not being able to participate. So, um, you know, if you have an anchor building that's all about it and, you know, willing to participate, that'd be a 10. Um, but if you know a building or a client, you know, may not want to participate for whatever reason, you know, that's something you want to take into consideration as you're selecting a site or multiple sites. Low diversity, I already touched on this. You know, you want to make sure that you um, have balanced heating and cooling loads or you have a means of accomplishing that in the design of your system. Um, I al also touched on your on-site thermal resources. Uh, make sure that you've got opportunities to, to install your adequate thermal capacity in the system. And this would also include a, a geological analysis um, if you're opting for a, a closed loop system. Um, building diversity, uh, that's what I spoke on earlier on the, the cooling loads th over the course of the day um, to make sure that um, you know, you're designing the system and you're selecting a diverse set of buildings. Um, and also lastly, our, our last weighted criteria that we have here in this example is uh, ease of conversion. This would both play into the number of building owners at each site that you have to consult with and you know, deal with um, crossing property lines as well as, um, you know, as there are other technical challenges with converting the HVAC systems in existing buildings. We've got three um, unweighted parameters there. Um, conversion risk is, you know, how dependent is the loop on one or two buildings? Um, you know, if you've got a, a large cooling dominant building, you want to make sure that, um, you know, there's some inherent risk of if that building were to go out of business, um, you would need to be prepared to, to accommodate that in your system design. And then lastly, expandability. Um, you know, is it expandable to nearby neighborhoods if the project were a success? And replicability throughout the, the whole service territory. So um, we take all those, assign a, a score of one to 10 for each of the criteria, um, weighted and unweighted um, for each site. I've got the, the specific sites um, blocked off there because those are um, yet to be publicly available. And from that, we can essentially attain a, you know, a weighted score that will aid, aid our clients in selecting a site um, that you know, best fits their needs and also is a cost-effective and technically effective solution. So before I hand it over, I'll just uh, run through one example of a site. Um, this was a shortlisted site that uh, had an anchor building that you can see there is the, the big tall stack right there, um, a YMCA type of building. Um, this is actually a building that's being renovated and they, they expressed interest in participating. So um, customer acquisition risk was there rated as a 10 because our biggest, our largest anchor building, um, you know, was definitely interested in participating. Low diversity, so the graph you see up here in the top right, um, that's the heating and cooling loads over the course of the entire year um, for each building on the, the district system. And as you can see, the, the, red, uh, the red bar charts right there, those are the heating loads, and then the blue is the cooling load. So you can see this is quite a, a heating dominant building or building uh, loop. And then there's uh, plenty of room for thermal resources. Um, you know, a, a diverse set of buildings. You've got a large um, apartment complex as well as a number of uh, commercial buildings. And then ease of conversion, um, you know, a lot of this is unknown as we're um, browsing publicly available information, but we do know some buildings. Um, so those assigned to seven. And customer acquisition risk, replicability, expandability, you know, these are all pretty middle of the road. Um, it is a replicable site. And also it's in a densely populated area, so it's would be easily expandable in the future. So from there, um, you know, we've essentially assessed, uh, you know, the, that one of these sites is feasible. It's one of our, our top scoring sites. So based on our preliminary energy loads um, in our project budget, we can assess, you know, what's our project boundary, um, and then put together the the total heating and cooling loads for the entire loop throughout the year to kind of you know, sanity check, you know, is this really uh, a balanced system? Um, and then also I'm showing here on the, the bottom right is the different building load profiles. These are cooling load profiles in July, um, just demonstrating that, you know, you do in fact have uh, buildings peaking at different times throughout the day. So this is all information that, you know, can be fed to the, the client to make sure that they're um, being educated in the, the site selection that they um, select for their project. Um, and also it kind of 
is a, a great first step as you're developing your, your design. So with that, um, I'll pass it over to Mitch. Thanks, Aaron and Dan. Uh, so that the challenge here now, uh, and having followed uh, a couple of very strong uh, team members here or panelists, is uh, talking about very similar type of approach. You know, CHA and my team, we go through a very similar technical approach. Um, and so I'm going to touch a little bit on, from a technical standpoint, what we use in site selection, but also get a little bit more into uh, some of the financial drivers, some of the you know societal impacts and drivers that help take these projects from a technical feasible standpoint and bring them across the finish line. Um, you know, so uh, we heard already, you know, the, the word anchor customers. Uh, I like to use the, the term the champion, right? At every project, in order for it to be successful, you need a champion, a really good partner who is very motivated to take the project forward. I ideally, if the champion is more than one or multiple champions, you get kind of a, a group of folks that are interested in, you know, working together, collaborating, making something really work out. Um, that's, that's first and foremost one of the most important processes that we go through is finding those people that are really motivated to go forward. Um, and then, you know, we heard uh, several of the primary kind of technical considerations already. I'm not going to touch uh, too much in depth on those, but um, from, a, from a geothermal project specific standpoint, you know, there's, there's the obvious, um, is there a good strong geothermal resource? Is there a good can, you know, um, green space availability, is there, is there space to put these wells in? Um, and how does that match up to the, uh, the loads of the buildings that you're trying to serve for your, your, your champions, your anchor buildings? Um, and then of course, uh, in many of the projects we're looking at, they're not just geothermal based. Uh, one of our considerations from a technical standpoint, we always like to coincide or co-locate wherever possible the projects with uh, geothermal that's located adjacent to uh, other diverse uh, load sinks and sources, so you know, surface water, uh, wastewater, any other um, kind of uh, uh, area we can grab heat from or, or uh, get rid of heat to, uh, ideally that makes uh, the system overall a little bit more cost effective in, in most cases. Um, so a, from a kind of a pro project financial standpoint, you know, we, we have looked into a number of projects through um, kind of the U10 and C10 programs, both uh, that are focused in on uh, areas with uh, gas pipeline, gas infrastructure in place. Uh, we're starting to see a lot of major opportunity in, uh, in areas where those thermal fuels are more expensive, right? So in delivered fuel customer cases, that brings a massive opportunity to these projects in that uh, the, basically the starting point for thermal energy costs is significantly higher and, and as such, uh, the potential for revenue generation or, or energy savings potential benefits uh, are, are also much higher. Um, well, I have a chart kind of on the top right. Any, anybody that's been in district energy and has worked in, you know, the combined heat and power industry knows the term spark spread. We're kind of looking at like the opposite or the inverse of a spark spread in this case, right? We're kind of uh, hoping for the opposite that we've been hoping for in district energy for many years now. Um, high, high gas, low electric costs is, a, is generally a financial indicator of, uh, you know, projects that will end up working out well for us in a, in a financial standpoint. Um, obviously, uh, there's many programs and, and many initiatives statewide, uh, countrywide that are targeting uh, reduced carbon footprint, reduced greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and so I, you know, I have referred local law 97 anywhere where there are programs that are uh, carbon taxes of sorts or, or dollars, uh, avoided dollars spent, uh, another financial driver that helps improve the likelihood of these projects moving forward. Uh, of, and then of course, you know, in, in any of the prospective connect, connect customer cases, uh, any of those systems being uh, at end of useful life, ready to be replaced, uh, avoided capital costs for replacement is another major, uh, major driver of these. Uh, and then more on the kind of the societal benefit or the, the, the societal or community drivers of these projects. Um, you know, we, we are looking into many of these projects that are e either wholly municipally owned or in part municipally owned. Uh, and those are major drivers in, in a number of different um, kind of, uh, in, in different avenues. You know, and those projects that are fully owned or even partially owned all have the benefit of being able to take some of the revenue generated once, you know, capital cost recovery has been achieved uh, and return all of that revenue 
back into the community in some form. There's, I've listed many potential tax reductions, potential uh, community betterment programs, you know, park restoration, so on and so forth. Um, but then also being able to maybe leverage that uh, revenue generation and turn it into the, the next phase two, three, four build out in that community of the same uh, thermal energy network. Um, uh, you know, inherent benefit of reduced utility rates where possible, where capital cost recovery and some of the financial drivers play out in favor of the projects. Uh, another inherent benefit, particularly in, you know, LMI disadvantaged communities, um, reducing utility rates is key. Uh, you know, improvement to local air quality. Uh, this is even more so kind of uh, noticed and in, in, uh, resonates more so in the delivered fuels communities where, you know, boilers local, you know. I've walked through some of the North Country villages and, and heard the statement about, you know, the, the, the smell of burning oil and, um, you know, how great it would be to have that no longer be an issue and, and something that, that is uh, so obvious within our community. Um, and then the last two, um, you know, the, the Jobs Act piece that Joe uh, mentioned at the end of, uh, of his introduction to the Utenja, um, you know, job creation and, uh, and potential job transition, um, you know, we're, we'll talk about an example project with some job transition opportunities. So I'm going to touch on a, a couple quick case studies here. Uh, so the first one, uh, City of Troy. Really, um, just just showing where the city of Troy has a lot of the kind of the considerations that we that, that I just mentioned here and, and that we've been kind of talking through. Um, you know, this project is uh, shared uh, partial municipal municipal ownership. The idea is that they would own the uh, the the uh, energy generating resource, uh, and then a third party would uh, distribute that power and 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 work uh, locally with the customers in uh, in the uh, billing side of things. Uh, it's within uh, a disadvantaged community. Um, you know, it's a primarily geothermal-based project uh, located right along the Hudson River there. Um, although if in its uh, proximity to the river, uh, the, the expectation is that, that there's future expansion capable of the network to uh, river water heat exchange and or uh, sewer heat exchange. Um, there's a, a really great low diversity there. There's some really old historic buildings, there's some new construction buildings going in, some new uh, major renovation projects going on. Um, and then, you know, the, the kind of overall load diversity in, um, uh, in both the kind of load side and demand side, but as well as the energy source side. Um, so a mix of just about everything we talked about so far. Uh, the second case study that I'll touch on a little bit is the village of Saranac Lake. Uh, this one you know, one of the North Country delivered fuels uh, projects. Um, really great opportunity here in a job transition early on in talking to the, uh, the community there. Um, we actually brought in all of the owners of the delivered fuels companies, the, the fuel oil and propane delivery companies, uh, brought them into a meeting with the, you know, village leadership and, and actually started discussing the opportunity to transition those folks to, you know, from delivering fuel oil and propane to ultimately becoming geothermal drillers, which we know is a major uh, shortfall and shortcoming in, uh, in, New, York sh in New York State. Similar, uh, this one would also be municipal ownership. Um, and, and we're also looking into potentially supporting this with uh, an EPA grant. And through that, hopefully uh, getting some support in, um, in building side conversions to help kind of support the, the customer base and, uh, and customer acquisition cycle. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand over. Excellent. Well, it's uh, tough to go last, and I, I have to be careful not to gesture because it's very close to the edge of this platform. Uh, so let's see. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> I'm good. Uh, so I, I want to start by just putting some context on this site selection process everyone's gone into, um, and that is that we're in the innovation phase of geothermal networks not the components, but the deployment. And that's a really different process. It's not that everyone is asking, can we do it in this site? Because almost all of them, you can say yes. The question is, how much is it going to cost? And is it going to be a good example? And are we going to hit, hit problems that, that trip us up? Because the first times you do something, it's always going to cost more because you're learning. 
and it's always going to cost more because you're making mistakes. That's what learning is, right? Um, and and so you want to go for a project like everyone's kind of laid out that has the most bang for the buck with the fewest obstacles. And so that's, I, to me, that's what these site selection lists are about. Um, so I am representing a, a nonprofit, um, and we actually make no money from selecting sites at all. Um, we're really committed to driving this transition forward and bringing all stakeholders together. And so I'm gonna add a slightly different perspective about process of engagement, um, because just assuming that we're gonna pick sites we can do. Uh, to me, the, the biggest barrier, and everyone's mentioned it in some part, is uh, the engagement of the people in the project. And it's not just the people who sign up, um, but also just everyone in the entire project, including decision makers and, and workforce and others. Um, and let's see, I gotta click, there we go. Um, so uh, what feels like a long time ago in early 2020, uh, we we've, we've, uh, ran a, a community charrette with um, representatives from as many people uh, we considered stakeholders as we could possibly get in the room, and that ranged from um, the gas utilities, gas workers, to uh, scientists and academics, to community members, activists, environmental justice representatives. Um, you think of it, we tried to get people in the room, and then we divided them up by uh, kind of perspectives, government perspective, community perspective, municipal perspective, um, and asked them, you know, in an engaging process, uh, what they were concerned about, what they cared about, how they would select a site, what they thought was important. And all of their responses are online on our website. We s distilled it into a site selection checklist, which is nowhere near as detailed as what folks have presented. They, they've come a long way, and it's been wonderful to see the site selection process for Eversource Gas and National Grid in Massachusetts really evolve in complexity and, and, and uh, considerations. Um, but that's where it started was from that community engagement and hearing all the voices. And I just want to point out the difference between asking the community um, to tell you something or informing them of something and really creating space for people to feel safe to say what they're actually worried about. And I just, we've learned that over and over again. Um, and so we did a second part of the process for the first site going in the ground in Massachusetts. Um, there was the wonderful problem of having many uh, sites vying to be selected, um, which is you know a problem we all wish to have. Uh, but a, as a second round of community engagement in the site selection process, we ran another charrette, this time in person because the pandemic had faded enough that we were felt we could almost stand next to each other. Um, and and um, we had 63 participants, and you can see the list there, um, all uh, digging into the, the metrics and the evaluation and the outcomes and the risks and the opportunities of each of four sites. Um, and it was a, a fascinating experience. There were things that bubbled up that were important, but maybe far more important was that so many different people heard each other's perspectives and learned and got their questions answered. And to me, that's the part about innovation, the innovation phase that we're in that's so important, is that it's not just site selection, it's site and stakeholder education. And so um, I just, you know, there's, there's so many details about site selection one can go in, but I, I just felt like I would, you know, hedge my bets, assume everyone covered all the details, and that we would instead look at the process. Um, and I, I think the last plug I'll make is that the metrics do matter. And when you think about something like environmental justice or a vulnerable population, when we're picking a site, are we looking for the dollars per square foot? Or are we looking for energy burden reduction? And when you look for energy burden reduction, you're gonna take on the slightly more challenging renter or low-income customer um, who, who might need additional um, what, you know, uh, building alterations without necessarily having the ability to pay, but you're gonna get the, so there's challenge there, I'm acknowledging, but you're gonna get a greater energy burden reduction, a human well-being increase that you're not necessarily gonna get when you maximize the dollars for the square foot transition. And so 
just putting it out there that uh, these these questions of like, do we put this in an environmental justice neighborhood? Do we recruit low-income customers, renters? It's sometimes harder. But what are we actually trying to do? So I'll end there. So I noticed a few people frantically taking notes. The slides will be available. Um, so you don't have to uh, rush through your note taking. Um, do we have questions? Yeah. So I have I have a question for Daniel, who I can't see. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. What was the drawback of a steam uh, steam heated building? That's where I live and just crushed my hopes so uh, it was really just the complexity that you'd have to put a completely different uh, a completely new type of system in um, and you couldn't like reuse the steam assets or the steam piping in that type of building and so that was basically the main drawback uh, that we saw for steam buildings Sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jane Bergman from Zane Energy Project in New York City. Um, I have a technical question, um, particularly I think to Aaron, but Mitchell, actually Aaron Mitchell and Zainab. Um, as everyone knows, all of the utilities are required to uh, propose at least one thermal energy network in each of their uh, territories. National Grid in Brooklyn, also known as Kedney, has proposed one for an area adjacent to Sterrett City in Brooklyn. And that project, um, well, first, the first part of my question is, is it a thermal energy network if it's just a geothermal project? That is, if it does not involve the capture of heat from some other source? So that's one question. Or is it just a community geothermal? or distributed geothermal or district geo geothermal. And the second, and how would that fit in relation to a NYSERDA uh, request for proposals? And the second is that proposal that National Grid submitted, and I hope some of our friends from the company are here, is strictly a heat only proposal. So given the need to balance heat and cooling, would it not be the case that that is, from an engineering perspective, completely absurd? Or is it feasible? Thank you. I guess I'm not, I can't speak on the specifics of the, the project that you're talking about. Um, I think the, the definition that we're at least using is for a, a thermal energy network would be um, a series of interconnected buildings connected to um, one or more thermal loads as a district system. So I think that's the definition that um, we're going off of for that. I can help with that a little. Those projects are being reviewed by staff and those questions have been asked. I can't go into it right now, um, but exactly what you have asked is what we're reviewing. I'll, tr I'll try. Um, I think that so there's dissipation of energy in the ground, and so the rate of that determines um, how much infrastructure, how many how many linear feet of borehole you'd need in order to only do heat and and have it dissipate uh, successfully enough. So your risk in doing only heat is really about uh, the amount of infrastructure. You're not going to have the infrastructure cost reductions and linear feet reductions that a balanced load would provide. Again, we're back to cost. It's not that you can't do it. It's just you're going to put more in the ground infrastructure-wise. And it, you know, depending on the situation and the specifics of the site, may or may not be the optimal choice. 
Um, and as far as the, the language, I'll just say that every state is trying to figure out what each of these light terms actually means. It's greatly needed, um, but my understanding, and someone from New York can you know, take me aside afterwards, <laughs> is that a, a thermal energy network um, is, uh, takes on opportunistic thermal sources and sinks, like, say, an ice ring or a databank, but it doesn't mean there is one. So it doesn't have to have one if you have just boreholes or even just perfectly balanced two buildings that you connect, it's technically a thermal energy network. Um, the, the goal is to do that optimal design wherever that site is. So again, site specific. Uh, <coughs> Lee Byers, my question was about redundancies when you're designing these systems. What kind of redundancies are typically built in so that if something were to fail, you know, you don't lose an entire neighborhood heating, cooling. And then the, uh, just one other quick question was about um, if, the if it's not a municipal utility, who else is going to pay for it, like typically? So I can take a first shot. So, so on the redundancy, re reliability, resiliency, there's, uh, there's a lot of schools of thought on how to approach that. Um, in a conventional residential house, for example, vast majority of the homes in New York State don't have backup generators, right? So even if you have a gas furnace in your home, when the power goes out, you have no heat. Similar type of argument can be made for a thermal energy network, right? The, the redundancy is only good as the redundancy on the building side. Um, and, and frankly, unless you're providing power to an entire community, um, in many cases, your redundancy you're providing is not uh, going to be a holistic across the entire community. There's there's a lot of thought being put into that, and uh, we're, we're trying to consider how effectively to m meet right. Um, in these, the other the other issue is that there's uh, or consideration I should say is that um, from a redundancy standpoint, especially in like ambient loop systems, for example, a two pipe or a one pipe loop, um, it's fairly easy to provide redundancy on the pumps. Uh, and you can provide a backup generator, you can keep w water flow moving. Um, but on the other side, w whatever is being connected to on the customer side, um, those can also similarly keep redundancy on the loops and it's a longer, much longer time frame, uh, assuming the customer has backup power already for themselves in a power outage, for example. Um, generally, it takes a longer time for those systems to start to saturate or overheat uh, on the customer side. So there's a lot that goes into considering it. Um, it's all being thought of and, and being sort of wrapped into the programs. Um, just following up on uh, kind of what Mitch had said is, you know, one of the things that uh, we recommend putting in is an electric resistance coil in your heat, in your air source here, or in your uh, ground to air heat pumps, and that'll get you the backup power if for some reason the geothermal system has gone down. So you'll have it there on the air side in the houses. And then, you know, as far as who else is funding these, I know a lot of colleges, universities are doing network systems on their campuses uh, to bring in, to get the energy efficiency and to decarbonize those campuses. I'll add one more redundancy resilience item, which is that if uh, there are some cases where you put um, your backup on the main loop, uh, which allows you to meet any extraordinary peaks or troughs or system issues um, centrally at lowest cost and also allows the managing thermal utility to ensure that the temperature delivered is within an optimum range and never freezes so you can eliminate glycol. So there's a, there's a potential to put that back up on the central loop and get some gains for that in some situations. Um, And, I, and just finally, the, the ownership side of things. It, I, there's almost an infinite number of arrangements in how these systems are being contemplated from an ownership perspective and uh, financing and, uh, and can kind of construction P3 partnerships. You know, we, we worked on the Troy project with, uh, with Siemens, for example. They, they helped uh, provide an opportunity potentially for financing uh, there's many other similar types of companies that do that kind of work, um, and I know many in the 
4614 program uh, are, are very well versed in kind of bringing third party financing in, potentially be third party owners in the, in the system within the municipality. So in selecting sites that leverage water sources, um, perhaps you know, in an open loop system, uh, we're seeing with climate change continued acidification of water. And so all of those water resources may in, in fact be more acidic. So does that affect the life cycle of the mechanicals? Uh, so I'll just say really quickly that um, the projects that we're contemplating that are uh, surface water connected are all closed loop. Um, in almost every case, we're trying to avoid the idea of, of a direct interface with the river. Those, those are happening commonly. They're, they're all over the Hudson River. We, we help sort of support some of the management of those as well. Um, but at least in the projects that we're involved with, we're trying to keep them a closed loop so that they are not being impacted by those things. Also say that we have a, a panel on this tomorrow for um, leveraging groundwater as a heat exchanger. So there's definitely different options there if you're concerned about water quality and um, the integrity of your system's components. Question back. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to respond to the Kedney question. Uh, I'm actually working with National Grid on that project. Uh, there is a cooling option that it's not just proposed that there's a heating option, there is a cooling option. The, the cooling option is significantly more expensive than the heating option because we can't utilize the existing risers in the building, so we have to go apartment by apartment. The project itself consists of two residential towers, a community center, and two large strip malls, which will help balance out the thermal load on that, on that uh, project. So, um, just wanted to clarify. Yeah, you can you can find those proposals on the DMM website, do you, under the matter number twenty two M zero four two nine, and there will be review um, review of those projects online soon. Uh, hi, my name is Jason Masters. I just wanted to answer your question about acidification real quick. So I actually am on the committee for the New York State Ocean Acidification Task Force. Uh, as far as open loop is concerned, you, DEC is going to have a very difficult time giving you a permit for, for an open loop geothermal on the ocean side. As far as acidification of groundwater, that's not, a, that's not an issue for climate change. <laughs> Uh, right now, my other question was on the on the 500 foot limit for uh, for geothermal wells. Is there a group that's working towards an abeyance of the reporting and requirements that DEC has now imposed upon a series of wells? Is there a group that's working towards mitigating that so we can drill wells deeper than 500 feet? without the reporting burden that we know is not there since we're not mining. Does anyone know? <laughs> yes, Mike? Yes. There's also a session on that too. I don't okay. know. Not to. <laughs> so yes. Is that tomorrow too? Yeah. yeah. There's a surface water panel as well tomorrow. Um, hey guys. Um, I, so far all the networks that you've described, they're all ambient loop networks, correct? Steve, let everybody know who you are and where you're from. Sure. Uh, my name is Steve Gerges. I'm with Ramble Engineering. Um, and we are helping, uh, full disclosure, we're helping, we're helping, we're helping uh, DPS evaluate the U10 networks. In your evaluations of these sites, are you guys considering at all centrally distributing chilled water and, and low-temp hot water? Because a lot of the issues that you guys talk about with regard to redundancy or even, you know, re relieving stress on the grid can all be addressed centrally from a central plant. Yeah, so I think, you know, what we've seen so far in the customer interfacing side uh, becomes the, the, the challenge in uh, compatibility from a building standpoint. And we're addressing compatibility in, in a lot of different ways. 
And in most of the cases that we've been involved with, there's, there's some projects that have fantastic opportunity for a four pipe. Uh, absolutely, and we do have some of those projects where we are uh, looking to implement the four pipe. Some of them uh, in some nodes of our uh, greater distribution network, and so an ambient loop then connected to a four pipe that goes into existing chilled water, hot water systems. Um, on the on the ambient loop side, we feel that there's greater benefit in load sharing between buildings and, and the opportunity to basically extract heat from, say, a data center or a ice rink or something that is year-round uh, rejecting heat um, and then being able to potentially load share take that energy into another source that's inherently the reason heat pumps uh, and water source heat pumps have been used in, at high efficiency for so many years uh, you're, you're correct on that but that could also be addressed at a central plant level where you know you're providing chilled water for one building and at the same time simultaneously heating another Potentially, right? I think um, that I think there's. A, I feel like there's more limiting factors in most of the uh, most of the building configurations, the the uh, combinations of buildings that we've looked at so far, uh, where those buildings and the load profiles of those, and then and similarly, a number of our projects already had distributed heat pumps, and so there was a lot of the driving force behind selecting that technology. Uh, for that reason, I'm, I'm providing a condenser loop to a building that already is condenser loop fed. An, another factor uh, is moving from site selection of a single loop to growing a thermal network at a municipal scale. And if you are able to use a, a you know ambient temperature loop, single pipe, you can interconnect loads and or loops uh, at any point on the loop over time and space. And the more you have, the more you can predict those loads, the less importance it is to have one client come on or off. Um, and that potential for scaling is, is a huge part of the momentum behind the single pipe. Uh, and I, I will just add that, you know, the, the beauty of the uh, synchronous load cancellation uh, it, it's not just the extremes that are easy to think about, like the, the you know, skating rink. As um, our Bureau Hubbold study uh, found, there's uh, a lot of low diversity even in a row of single-family homes at times. So. Thank you. I got a guy behind me. He's been waiting. Yeah, this is uh, Cole Burgess with Avangrid. Um, quick question for you, Mitchell. Uh, one of your guys' characteristics or criteria was line load diversity. Can you just define that? Yeah, so uh, in, in very simple terms, we're not running a pipe uh, half a mile between buildings if there's nothing in between it. Um, so it's the easiest way to kind of explain that, right? We want to try to have tight load diversity and uh, load density uh, coincident to the distribution network that we're trying to run. Uh, so in lieu of running a pipe a long distance to get to another cluster of buildings, uh, build another network effectively. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi all, uh, Andrew Steiner with Darcy Solutions. Mitch, you made a um, point earlier about the problem with geothermal drilling in New York, <clears throat> or the challenge that everyone's aware of. For those of us not from New York, is it a capacity supply issue or was there other issues you were talking about? No, so my reference was mostly related to just physical space, right? And a lot of the projects that we're looking at because of the low density we're trying to target, um, there's not a lot of green space to put wells in. There's a lot of solutions that are hitting the market that are helping to kind of resolve some of that um, and, and, you know, creative or unique ways to drill geothermal wells, but uh, strictly a, a, you know, a horizontal space consideration. Cool. Thank you. We'll come tomorrow. Uh, we'll talk about groundwater. Hi, Nate Lamb from the Cornell Climate Jobs Institute. My question was, is there a increase or a decrease in attractiveness for an area if there are already houses that have individual wells, uh, individual uh, geothermal systems? Does that complicate the process? And uh, like I said, is it more or less attractive uh, to you when you're just selecting a site? I'm gonna quick say both, um, because you have a resource that's available to you but so does the prospective utility customer that you're trying to connect to. Uh, and therefore, the kind of negotiation process that you go through with that customer is not 
uh, one where you're offering something that they don't have right now, and you're not then taking the capital investment that they would have to um, bear the burden of away from them, right? And that's one of the inherent benefits a lot of these systems is uh, centralizing that, taking that burden off of a customer. Do we have one last question before we wrap up? Hi, Rhys Christie from uh, Geostars Energy. I was just wondering if um, you mentioned horizontal space being a primary constraint on lots of these builds in New York. Um, have you guys considered any like angle drilling techniques to get underneath these uh, buildings that, or getting, getting underneath spaces that are inaccessible from the surface with ver vertical drilling? Uh, yes, uh, we have uh, we have uh, looked at it. Um, there's actually a company, uh, Stan Reitzman. I believe he's at the conference. Uh, his company does it, and you know he's uh, you know one of the founders or one of the experts in doing it. Um, and then recommend reaching out to them. Perfect. He's uh, my boss. So. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Please visit our panelist booths if you have other questions. Thank you.